this is if men were angels teaching the Constitution with the Federalist Papers. Let's go to our first poll question. And this is to get an idea of how you teach about the Constitution. What main methods or what methods do you use to teach about the framing of the U.S. Constitution? A, I have students research a project about the Constitutional Convention of 1787 and the history of ratification. B, I have students do a simulation. C, I use lecture, discussion, and primary source readings. Or D, other methods. And go ahead and write those in the chat area. You can check off as many of these at, as pertain to your teaching. This is great. So a lot of you use a combination of lecture and discussion with primary source readings. That's great. And some of you use uh, simulations. Uh, simulations, uh, we found uh, research shows that simulations and role play both are really important ways of teaching uh, civic engagement, uh, and civic mindedness, as well as the content of history or government or whatever the social studies subject is. Uh, because students are actually in a role and they're, they're able to um, understand multiple perspectives by participating in a simulation. And actually one of the activities we're going to look at for the Federalist Papers today is a role play, role play debate. I'm just going to give a little bit of an introduction to who we are, Constitutional Rights Foundation. For those of you who might not be familiar with who we are, Constitutional Rights Foundation, CRF, is based in Los Angeles and we're a nonprofit. We are also a nonpartisan organization uh, that deals particularly in civic education. We've been around over 50 years. We provide professional development like this online and also in-person, face-to-face professional development, programs for teachers, and programs for students as well. So we have a EHI, which is, which is our uh, intern program here in Los Angeles, and our mock trial program throughout the state of California. We run, at, we develop every year and run the Los Angeles County and California statewide mock trial competition. And that's one of the things that we are known for, especially here on the West Coast. So we're pleased to have all of you here with us who may already use our materials and all of you who are new to us as well. In the email that I send out to all the participants after this, you'll see a link where you can subscribe to our free quarterly publication, Bill of Rights in Action, that actually has lesson plans and it comes to you free quarterly. So let's move on to our webinar. In today's webinar, we have a few objectives for you. One is we hope that you'll be able to, in looking at this lesson and listening to what we say, gain a background knowledge on the Federalist Papers. And as I mentioned a moment ago, including some of the underlying philosophy. And the lesson also will show you the historical significance of the papers. Uh, also, uh, we're going to focus today on using common core aligned approaches to teaching about the Federalist Papers, particularly reading in history social studies and writing in history social studies. Uh, and there's speaking and listening, of course. And we are really uh, indebted to Pam because she really helped develop the writing component uh, for the lesson that you're going to look at today. And that's so important in using common core aligned strategies in social studies. And finally, uh, you're going to learn about implementing reading and writing and discussion activities that actually makes the Federalist Papers come alive, makes it relevant and engaging for students. So the lesson itself, I'm going to give you an overview of the components. There's a focused discussion, sort of an anticipatory set that goes into the lesson. Then there's a pre-reading, which is a secondary source that we've developed here on what the Federalist Papers are, what they say. Uh, about separation of powers and federalism. And from that, students then move into a small group activity where they each take a, each group takes a question and looks at it in depth to present and discuss with the rest of the class. And that builds into a whole class discussion on each of those questions. Penultimately, there's the federalist versus anti-federalist debate. And this is the role play that I talked about. And finally, there are optional writing activities. There's a combination of different writing activities that you can do with your students. The lesson is geared mostly for middle school. I know we have a lot of high school teachers on this webinar as well, and we welcome you here. We want you to stay because 
the lesson, even though it's geared for middle school, with the optional writing activities and some of the different options in the activities throughout the lesson, you can actually tailor this for an 11th grade U.S. history class or even a 12th grade government class uh, when looking at the Constitution uh, would find this very useful. Uh, one of the things I wanted to emphasize too is that the parts you see here of the lesson work sequentially. So the lesson plan that you see up on the screen that you're actually going to be able to access today after this webinar shows you uh, the different components. We provide you with an overview and objectives. There's a list of materials and all of these are included in the same document. So there's, there are handouts for the students to use. And of course we look at national content standards and of course the common core state standards that you see listed here. So for the reading standards, we look at, of course, the standards relating to citing textual evidence, looking at central ideas of a text, even looking at key steps in a process. And in this particular process, you can think of the ratification of the Constitution. Uh, there was a process that the Federalist Papers were essential to, and that's what you're going to look at. Also, for some of the options in the activities, the students might also integrate uh, audiovisual or uh, other kinds of information into what they're doing. And of course, they're going to look at a range of readings um, and read independently and proficiently. In speaking and listening, students are going to use a range of discussions. As you can see already in the overview, there's small group discussions as well as whole class discussions. Uh, and they're going to look at uh, using civic dialogue while they're doing these discussions as well. And then moving down, we come to the important writing standards I talked about. And just to summarize, they're going to have options to write argumentative text as well as inform informational text or explanatory text. They're going to, of course, focus on using textual evidence to support their claims, look at clear and coherent writing, including the stages of planning and revising, so there's preparation that's involved. And all of these are described in the Common Core Standards that you see listed here. Uh, students can conduct a short research project. Uh, there's also an option for them to do that in the role play. And importantly, students, are, of course, are drawing evidence from informational texts. So those are all the standards you see here listed for the Common Core. And with that, I'm going to move forward. One more poll question. Since we've uh, now looked at uh, the lesson overview, before we get into uh, the kinds of activities we do, what are our main challenges that you face in getting students to do close reading and to use textual evidence? A, the grammar and vocabulary of many primary sources is often too complex. B, students do not see the relevance of historical texts to their own lives. C, it takes a lot of class time to examine documents or something else. I see, okay, A uh, seems to be overwhelmingly one reason why it's difficult to do close reading. And I, I, I can see that. I experienced that when I was uh, teaching as well, that grammar and vocabulary of primary sources sometimes can be daunting for students. But there are ways that you can help elucidate that for them and help, help get them into the text and understanding what they're, what they're reading. Which is We're going to look at the first part of the lesson, and I'm going to turn it over to Pam to take you through the focus discussion and other parts. All right, thank you. Uh, I just want to take a moment to emphasize discussion overall, the uh, benefits of discussion. As we know, discussion is fundamental in every academic discipline and in all types of lessons. And this particular focused discussion is really crucial to begin your exploratory or student's exploratory process of the Federalist Papers. Um, it provides a foundation for students to consider the significance of the Federalist Papers, but also it's going to engage students on a personal level and create a link between past historical events and the dynamics of the present. So it's going to be really uh, an important way to begin. And you can see here some of those questions that you'll be asking in the focus discussion or student consideration. And then after your, your focus discussion, you'll have a pre-reading section where you'll have an opportunity as a teacher, and this is in the, the actual lesson that you'll, that you'll get very shortly, but 
uh, you'll be able to provide a, uh, a short intro to the Federalist Paper readings. It's a paragraph that's in, uh, in the lesson that you'll be able to see very clearly. Close reading, I also want to emphasize um, close reading skills. And those are very, as you know, you're getting more familiar, or perhaps you've been familiar for some time with the Common Core. That's really central to Common Core standards. And close reading skills are absolutely imperative for student growth and development and success, both inside and outside the classroom. And you'll see in this particular lesson how all of the other learning activities that you're going to, uh, your students are going to experience in this lesson flow from this center, from uh, doing a good uh, close reading of the text. However, as we all know, as I know, being a longtime teacher, and I'm sure you know, students are not necessarily predisposed to reading closely. When you mention close reading, you don't get always a lot of cheers and hurrahs. So we as teachers have to be very creative in how we draw students into the text. And so they don't even realize sometimes how closely they are reading. And it becomes a very natural predisposition to read closely. So activities to bring students into closer proximity with the text are not just important for student engagement, but also for student understanding and for really for their progress as students over a longer period of time. As we know, there, there are students in your a middle school or high school classroom, but will go on being students in college and really for their whole lives. So their ability to read carefully and identify key ideas will then lead naturally to a facility with comparing and contrasting ideas and formulating further ideas of their own, which you will see in the lesson will be other components that you know, they will naturally progress to. So the first, after you, you know, introduce the students to the reading and they've had a chance um, to read, then they will participate in a small group activity. And it will be your choice, certainly as a teacher, how you want to uh, split them up into small groups. You'll see that there are 10 discussion questions that take the material that they have read and have broken it down into uh, central questions. You certainly can have use whatever method you, you think your class is most receptive to. You can assign each group a question or have them volunteer. But once you've done that, you're going to split them up into uh, small groups. And since there are 10 questions, this should allow, and I know that in different classrooms there are different class sizes, but still you should be able to have a workable group of perhaps three or four students in, in each group. And this small group activity that's designed here, you'll see you have two options. And it can serve as a very significant strategy to help students navigate the complexities of the readings about the Federalist Papers. As you indicated in the previous poll question, that this is often a challenge in having students do close reading especially the early historical papers are very difficult and even the concepts about them in readings that are summarized in them can be very complex. So this small group activity is the purpose is certainly to draw the students into the readings but it's also has another important purpose in that it gives an opportunity for students to communicate their understanding of ideas to others. So you're going to see very quickly here how this small group activity is linked to the one that comes after it, which is a large class or a whole class discussion. So here are your options. Option A would be to have the small groups write a detailed answer to one of the questions on handout A. And then in their answer, in their written answer to the question, of course, you want them to use at least one supporting quote to provide textual evidence and to also discuss among themselves how they're going to present 
their ideas to the class because they're going to become experts on this one aspect of the reading and they're going to communicate what they have learned and what they have uh, interpreted to the class. So that's option A. Option B is very similar, but instead of writing their answer in a written form, they're going to make a poster uh, of whatever size that you deem appropriate, anything from eight and a half by 11 to larger, depending on what your materials that you have available or what you, you might want to put these posters up in your class later. Um, they can make nice visuals and brighten up your class as well. But they're going to make a poster that incorporates the key ideas in their section of the reading. So they're going to do the same thing as option A, but they're going to put the content of the answer in visual form. They're also going to use one supporting quote. And here you'll see we pulled up just a sample of what a group could do. When I've used this technique in my classroom, uh, sometimes students say, well, can we get on our computers and can we pull out? I pulled out, certainly you see I didn't draw this, but uh, you know, they can, can we find something and print it out? But often I have students, you know, if I have a big box of markers or colored pencils or crayons, have them just create their own visual. And that can be fun and very creative as well. So if you use option B, they create the poster. They also are prepared to present their, um, their answer to the class. Then the next part, um, after the small group activity uh, has completed, will be the whole class discussion. And you're going to use the small group presentations of their ideas as a catalyst for a large group discussion. And I think it's a very organic way to provide focus and deepen student exploration and also reinforce their communication skills overall. Anytime students get an opportunity to get up in front of the class um, to, to talk, whether to engage in a, a dialogue with, uh, with their group or with the class at large or just to present ideas briefly. Uh, it, it's a good experience, as we know, for students. Uh, it doesn't have to be a long, complicated presentation. It could be something in a shorter manner such as this. So I want to take a moment to explain the process and also, I think, the advantages over a conventional large group discussion. Normally in a large group discussion you might have, let's say in our case here, 10 questions that students have covered. So you as a teacher then might lead a discussion of each question one by one. And I've done this, I think we've all done this, and it can be very effective um, it, particularly when you have a class that's very vocal and who likes to speak. But we also know we've had classes where we have a dynamic or a chemistry where maybe just a small group of students, three or four or five students, love to speak in class. And so you've got the same three or four or five hands raised and you're having to be very creative in getting those quieter students involved. And also, we've had a more of a conventional or traditional situation where students have done small group work and then you have them present their uh, findings one after another, where you take small group one, two, three, four, and so on. But this model is uh, slightly different. And I think in many ways, you'll find this model even more effective. What you would do is you would start, of course, with discussion question number one. And that group would come before the class and present its work, whether it's just going to verbally give an explanation of the ideas that they have um, synthesized or whether they have the poster that they give. If you've used option B and you have the poster, they can show their poster and explain how they came up with the visual abstract symbol. Um, you can then have them go into their ideas by explaining the thought process behind their artwork. While this is happening, I highly encourage you to ask students in the audience, the rest of the class, to take notes while the small group is presenting. 
or perhaps to write a couple of questions for further discussion. That way you keep the audience, the rest of the class focused, and uh, you can certainly even use this for points for students. We know the students love to get points for their work, and you can very easily circulate around the class and check them off that they've done this. But I think it'll make your discussion a very productive. So group number one does its presentation. And then instead of having group number one sit down and continuing with group number two, you would have that group remain at the front of the class. They, in fact, could lead the whole class discussion on that segment that they have presented. That gives them another opportunity to be leaders within the classroom and also a further opportunity to extend their speaking listening skills. You could have them call on other class members who might have comments about their presentation or questions about their presentation. You as the teacher have a role more as a facilitator, an important role as a facilitator, you can help maintain focus, add shape to the, to the discussion. You can ask further questions for student consideration and kind of keep the discussion rolling. When you as the teacher feel that you've exhausted, you know, discussion about that aspect of the Federalist Papers and about the student presentation, then group number one can sit down. And then you have group number two come to the front of the class and they do the same thing. They present their, the answers to the question, they, or they present their poster, they lead the uh, subsequent large group discussion on their segment of the Federalist Papers on the focus ideas about that. And then the, the discussion proceeds that way. And then group three, you know, and eventually through group 10. Again, in this activity, students have the center stage, and they have the opportunity to provide real leadership in the classroom. And I think you'll find that the discussion will go into areas and go into more depth than you've even found when you have been at the front of the classroom and just been having students raise their hand and getting them to participate that way. Thanks, Pam. And that's a good way of uh, segueing into the next part of the lesson, which is the debate. Um, in one way, you can look at what they've been doing with all of the previous activities, the focus discussion, pre-reading, small group, and whole group discussion activities, as ends in themselves. They are, they are doing this in order to gain that knowledge about the Federalist Papers and the history, uh, but it's also a preparation for them to participate fully in the role play debate. Because once they've done all of the activities, as Pam described, they'll be ready to think about the differences of opinion and enact those differences of opinion about the meaning of the Constitution or the, in, in this case, the desirability of a Constitution, as we see in the debate between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists. So here we have a picture of six uh, individuals. On the left, we've got our Federalists, the famous authors of the Federalist Papers, collectively known as Publius. We've got James Madison there at the top, and Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay. They say yay to the Constitution. And we've got our Anti-Federalists on the right, who said nay to the Constitution. And again, trivia question for the Federalist paper buffs out there. Can you identify these anti-federalists over to the right? I'm going to identify them in the next slide, but you know who some of them are. Patrick Henry, indeed. Ah, yes. George Mason, absolutely. And Richard Henry Lee, yes. Got all three of them identified. So in preparing for the debate, uh, students are going to work in groups. So they're going to actually support each other in getting the background information that they need to actually participate in the role play. And so you'll have your Federalist groups and your Anti-Federalist groups. And so each of these ovals here represent a different student group. You'll have six of them in your class. And there are biographies that we actually provide in the lesson plan. They're brief biographies, but uh, students can spend some time with them that give information about each of these famous Federalists or Anti-Federalists and why they supported or did not support the ratification of the U.S. Constitution. 
And so they get this information and they can use this. They can actually do the role play debate just using this material that we provided in the lesson plan. It all depends on you and how much time you have to devote to the Federalist Papers and teaching about the ratification of the Constitution, uh, whether you want to give them a few days to a week to actually work doing outside research, uh, to research more about the particular person that they're going to be using in this debate. Again, we, we said that's optional. Of course, we encourage you know, research, and we have it listed under the Common Core standards as well. But it should be optional because you know how much time you have in the classroom to devote to this, and uh, also your students having the time to do it as well, uh, and having the resources to do it. So we provided kind of a closed library so that they can basically do the debate. You decide how much supplementary material they're going to need. So once they've been using this, then they also have a handout C, which you see here. These are the student instructions for the debate. These also can help you, even though you've got the lesson plan, uh, they can help you as the teacher to structure the debate. So you've actually got uh, the instructions here. You'll see it from a student's perspective. We're going to get more into these questions in just a moment, but there are three basic questions that we have provided to structure the debate around. So let's take a look at what that debate's actually going to look like. So after students have worked in their research groups here, Step two is to organize the debate, and you organize it around these three questions that we've provided. And these are very general questions, but they get to the heart of what the difference is between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists. So the debate will be structured this way. You see you have your six groups. You have your Federalists on the left, Anti-Federalists on the right uh, in the diagram. And then from each group, they're going to pick one representative to go to the front of the class and participate in the debate. And as each student approaches the front of the class, of course, they're going to form a fishbowl, and they can do this debate as a fishbowl in front of the rest of the class. Now, how each group decides to pick a representative is up to you. It could be random, so that each student who is in their group uh, has to be ready to go. It could be maybe you want the different groups to elect the representative uh, for a democratic process. But the point is they're going to eventually form this panel, and then you can structure it uh, maybe by a flip of the coin. Presidential debates are done that way quite often. So uh, they can flip a coin to see which side will present first, or you can just have the Federalists go first since they are actually taking the pro position on the Constitution. But the question is structured such that it can be answered by either side with plenty of information. And so regardless how you decide to do it that way, uh, you'll go back and forth. So let's say the Federalists are going first, and so Jay might present first, uh, giving a, I would recommend it, 30 seconds to a minute and a half. Again, it depends on how much time you've allowed in the class for them to do outside research. If they're just using the material that we provide here, then I think you might find that about 30 seconds is enough time for students to actually present the information that they know, especially if they might be a little nervous about speaking in public. It gives them just a chunk of time to actually do it, and then feel warmed up when maybe they do a rebuttal later. But then you can go back and forth from one side to the next. So then once a Federalist speaks, an Anti-Federalist would then make an opening statement and respond to anything that they might have heard. And then it would bounce back to the Federalists, and a representative of the Federalists, say Madison, would then rebut or provide some rebuttal to what uh, he has heard from the Anti-Federalist then it would bounce back to the Anti-Federalists and so forth, so that when the final speaker is actually speaking, they can actually respond to all that they've heard in the entire debate. That's the process for question one, and it repeats for question two. So the same process, so that you have a different six representatives at the front of the class for panel number two, answering the second question. And of course, again, for the third question, panel number three would form to answer that question. Now in this way, you've got all the students involved in one respect, and that is they've all prepared to go forward and be, and be ready to go as part of the debate. But you've got, under this structure, 18 students who actually participate in the actual debate in the fishbowl. And maybe that works for your class structure. Maybe, let's say you have 36 students in your class, half of them will actually be participating in the debate, but all of them will have been expected to be ready to participate. 
But there are ways you can actually increase participation too. Uh, you might have your own ways of increasing participation, but I'm just going to point out a couple of different ways that Pam and I were thinking of that would be really good for you to be able to increase participation in the debate. One is to keep the fishbowls the way they are, so you have 18 students who are actually debating in their roles, and the rest of the groups uh, become questioners. They can even, even though they prepare for the debate and they've got their notes, and as Pam mentioned earlier, I think Pam mentioned, you know, students like um, points, you might have a point system to go around and give students points for their preparation for the debate, but also to form questions. And in this, they can drop their roles if they wanted to, as long as they're asking a question that can be posed to either side, kind of like the questions that we have modeled here. There's lots of material that they will have already read and prepared for by using the reading in the pre-reading section, which includes a chart that compares the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution. So they can draw their questions from there. For example, they might want to say, they might want to ask Madison or Jay, uh, why is it important that we have a federal judiciary? Why is that essential when we, under the Articles of Confederation, we had state courts, isn't that good enough? Madison or Jay or Hamilton can respond, and then an anti-federalist can provide a rebuttal to that so that the questioner's questions can actually be responded to by both sides. So that's one way of getting more students involved because they actually become questioners for the debate. Another thing that they can do, of course, is either way that you structure it, students can actually become judges of the debate, and that might be another way to bring in uh, more uh, activity from more students. At the end of each question, they might vote to see you know, who, want, who they think won that side of the debate, kind of like an opinion poll that you would see in a political debate or after a political debate these days. Another option is to have an alternate setup. Uh, this is a little more difficult. I was thinking in, these pre in the prior setup here that the teacher can be the moderator for the debate, which kind of makes it easy because then you sort of keep track of time and you make sure that each side gets adequately or is, can respond adequately to the question. But in the alternate setup, you might want to uh, have it so that you have two simultaneous debates going. This way, all the students, uh, or almost all the students, if you have a very large class, would be able to actually be debaters in the role of debaters uh, so that when they're in their original groups preparing for the debate, they'll half of them will be A's and half of them will be B's so that when it's time for the debate, they've all helped each other prepare, but then they split into two sides of the classroom and then you have their miniature fishbowls going on, so two different fishbowls going on at the same time. Now this is a little bit harder, but this means you can also assign other students who may not be participating in the actual role play to be moderators, one each for each side of the class. So that way, students are actually running the whole show. For you, you can just go around and you can check to make sure that they've all got their notes, they've all done the preparation uh, and assignment points if you want, and you can pop in and out of one or the other of the debates, but the students are actually running it. So that, that might be actually a good way of doing it, especially if you have a larger class and you want more students involved in the substance of the Federalist versus Anti-Federalist role play. An important part of the debate process is to debrief it. Now, this is also included in the lesson plan, but I, I want to emphasize something here uh, that's in the lesson plan, but I, I really want to draw your attention to, and that's that there are two components, or maybe I should say two levels, to debriefing the debate. It's really important that after students do an activity like this, that they debrief it. They break apart what they've done, uh, they, or they, they deconstruct it, and they look at it to assess what they've learned from the process. And the two components are, one, debriefing the role play itself, the learning process of the role play. And the second is to debrief the content, including all of the activities that they've done from the focus discussion all the way through the debate, just to see that they understand what's important and what might need emphasis in the actual content they've learned about the Federalist Papers and the role of the Federalist Papers in ratifying the Constitution, or whatever other content is you want to emphasize. So here are some examples. Here are two questions that could be used to debrief the actual process of the role play. And this is really good also to get more student involvement, because they'll be, even if they were more listeners than speakers, this is the time where they can actually share how closely they were listening. What was the best argument you heard someone make? This is something that can be asked of the debaters, 
and then asks of the, the audience or those who didn't actually participate in the debate but might have been questioners or listeners, uh, what was the best argument that they heard? What made that argument the best in their mind? Or based on the arguments they heard today, would they have favored or opposed the Constitution? Not based on their own opinion or their own feelings about the Constitution or what their own sentiments might be, but based upon just what they heard, just the arguments that were made during the role play, was there a position that they would now take? A follow-up question that I find interesting to always ask in a debate is, or a debrief like this is, did you have an opinion that changed? Was there something you heard that actually changed your opinion? And what was that? What was, what was it that changed your opinion? It's always interesting to find out because usually, I've done this with teachers as part of professional development, and there's always at least one person who says, you know, I, I felt strongly about A, but then when I heard the arguments, I changed my position to B, uh, just because of, I hadn't thought of it in, in the way that I heard today. The next level of the debrief is to debrief the content. So this is where they would actually talk about the arguments over putting a Bill of Rights in the Constitution. They can think back to small group activity or the whole class discussion that Pam described. So they, they've got this background knowledge. And based upon all of this, they would answer, you know, how did a Bill of Rights get added to the Constitution? Or what was the importance of the Federalist Papers in ratifying the Constitution? You know, we often think that in 1787, the Constitution was passed, and voila, we've got a new government for the United States. But what's important in learning about the Federalist Papers, you actually learn that, oh, wait, there's the second part. Much the same way if we uh, amend the Constitution today, and of course, on all the cases where it was amended, yes, there's a vote in order to pass an amendment, but it always has to be ratified. And it's often that's in the ratification process is where the real heated debates can, can happen. And that's what we saw in the publication of the Federalist Papers. And that's part of the review that they have here, too. So they're looking at the whole process, which brought us to 1789 and the ratification, when really the Constitution became the law of the land. I'm going to turn it back over to Pam, because as I mentioned, she was so essential in developing these writing activities. And she's going to talk about them. The writing activities are called optional writing activities. And they certainly are, but I really encourage teachers to consider doing one or both of them. The, there are really actually two writing activities. The quick write and the expository essay are linked. So that would be really one activity. And then the extended writing activity. Uh, and consider really that, that the, the writing activities flow naturally out of what your students have already accomplished. In the previous parts of the lesson, they've already engaged in close reading, they've used textual evidence, and engaged in both large and small group discussion. And all of these lead very naturally to writing activities and give students the tools to communicate in a written form their understanding of the material in a very clear and coherent and structured form. So first I want to talk just a bit about the quick write linked with the expository essay. And you'll have options for what form the expository essay would take. You'll see this when you look at the lesson. But the, the prompt for the quick write, which is really just a, a pre-writing activity, like the focus discussion was at the beginning of the lesson, the quick write performs the same function. Students would be asked, in 1787, I would have been a Federalist or an Anti-Federalist because. And so in a quick write, ordinarily in a quick write, you can use it in different ways. But I always like to use it in the classroom where the student just writes. I would time them, and they wrote nonstop for a short period of time, and then I would just call time. And that just gets the ideas moving in their, in their, from their mind onto the paper. And it's just a starting point, but an important one. It doesn't take too much time. And then you can consider which option you'd like to use for the expository essay. And this might be, which is a, a three-paragraph essay or a five-paragraph essay. And this might be determined by 
many things. The amount of time that you have to spend on it, it could be something you could do partially in class and partially out of class, or you could do uh, you could do the modeling for this and the explanation for the structure in class, and it could be a, an activity where the students would complete it outside of class. Or you may want to consider the three paragraph essay, depending if you have maybe a sixth grade class or a seventh grade class, or if you have a older students, or if you have students with higher skill levels, you might want to move into the five paragraph essay. So there are many considerations of which option you might use, but they're both really accomplishing the same thing, which is to answer this prompt. Discuss the advantages of either federalism or anti-federalism. Include at least three specific strengths of either view, and of course, using supporting quotes as well. So, and you'll see, again, you'll see all of this in the lesson and it's specified very clearly. But if you do the three paragraph essay, students would write an introduction with a thesis statement. They would have one body paragraph in which they would incorporate all three strengths and then a concluding paragraph to make three paragraphs. The five paragraph essay then would have an introduction and a thesis and would break down the body paragraphs. You would have three body paragraphs with one particular strength in each body paragraph. And then, of course, a paragraph of conclusion. So those are your options for that. And again, I, I really uh, hope that you decide to have your students write the expository essay. The other option, uh, optional writing activity, is what I called an extended writing activity, which gives uh, students the opportunity to combine their creative writing skills and techniques with using the substantial material that you've already covered in the lesson. And I know from my own experience and being a writing teacher for many, many years and really emphasizing all the different forms of the expository essay, students would often ask me, well, can we write something Creatively, Can we write something that is not uh, so structured? And of course, when you're trying to teach writing, you don't always have opportunities to do that. But in this case, you can combine creative writing techniques with an opportunity for them to use this very specific, detailed, factual material, but also to use their imagination. And what this involves is um, students choosing two current political figures. So instead of imagining, as they did in the debate, that they you know, might have been Madison or Hamilton, here they are imagining that they are uh, a current political figure. And they're also going to have to decide, they're going to have to pick two. One current political figure that they believe holds Federalist-like beliefs and another current political figure that they believe holds anti-federalist like beliefs. So they get, you know, you might want to consider uh, having a class discussion in which you ask the class to come up with a whole list of these uh, current political figures and put a list on the board. Um, you can certainly just have students choose for themselves, but it might be a good way to start this extended writing activity to, to really brainstorm with the class at large. It might get them excited about, about doing this. You could even use the extended writing activity as an extra credit activity if you didn't want the whole class to do it. But after they choose the current political figures, two of them, then they would be required to do a little bit of research to find out more about these people so that they would be able to take on the persona of each one of those political figures. And instead of writing an expository essay, they're going to be writing a dialogue between these two real people and writing that dialogue in script form. And this is all set out in the lesson for you, but I'll briefly explain what they're doing. They would write an, an introductory paragraph in which they would set the scene and create a mood. Uh, what were the circumstances of the fictional meeting? You know, where did these two people 
Did they meet in a coffee shop? Was it in the cloakroom of Congress? You know, where was this meeting where these two people sat down to talk about the differences in their political beliefs? So they would write this introductory paragraph, and then the bulk of the script would be the dialogue between them. And in this dialogue, they would use paraphrased material from the research that they'd done. They could use direct quotes as well. And also, I think it's very productive to give them the freedom to create language for uh, these two people. And, and in, again, to use a real combination of those three things, paraphrased material, direct quotes, and created language. Then you would have students write a concluding paragraph in which they summarize the significant areas of divergence between these two people. And that way you know they're doing a bit of analysis about what they've created. They've created uh, a conversation between these two people, but they've also thought about what are the real differences between them. So those are your options for your writing activities. And what I like, Pam, too, is that they cover a range of writing activities or writing standards, I should say, in the Common Core. So you've got expository writing, you've also got argumentative writing, both on the discipline-specific content. So they can form these arguments after getting the solid background from the content in the lesson. And there's a, a range, uh, including the creative writing, including the imaginative writing, where they can actually synthesize what they've learned. So uh, I think the way this is structured is really good, and it's optional so that you know your students, you can uh, pick which one of these or which combination of these might work. And even in the creative writing, they're using textual evidence and using factual material. So you're still hitting those common core standards too. Exactly. I, know, I saw some really good comments. I want to point out one uh, while you're thinking of questions, and that is a teacher wrote that while the students during the debate are giving their presentations, then the other students can have can take notes on each one of the Federalists and Anti-Federalists speaking. And the teacher wrote that she might even create um, you know, a handout or something that just has space for each of the six debaters and they can write down that information, which I think is a, a really good graphic organizer and a tool for them to take notes. Okay, so I have another question here. How many class periods ideally would you set aside for this lesson? That's a really good question. Again, it's sequential. So you want to make sure that you cover all the parts of the lesson. And I think this, uh, the entire lesson here could cover, it could cover a week, I'd say, which means, you know, five days. The debate activity, again, it could be something that's done in one class period, but, um, you know, the preparation for it might be done in a previous class period. So it might take more than one class period for that. But I think the actual teaching of the activities uh, with the focus discussion and everything, probably, I'd say, four to five days. The writing activity can probably be done as an extension outside of the class. Absolutely. Absolutely. You would just need to make sure that students under, understood the requirements and laid all of that out. You could use handouts as well mm -hmm. and go over those. And, but yes, that could be done outside the class. Right. And some of the reading, too, um, if you can't devote all four or five days, uh, then some of the reading can be done as homework with the discussion activity being done the next day. And that saves class time. I would say that the way we have it structured, using the Federalist Papers is a great way to teach the Constitution. So it actually fits into a constitutional unit uh, teaching content about the Constitution. So a lot of you are on here, you have a you already have an interest or knowledge about the Federalist Papers, you know how important they are and how important they were. Uh, so it's something that can be worked into a unit on the Constitution, I think, without detracting at all from teaching about what the Constitution is. Because the lesson actually points out a lot of the, the main components of the, the way the Constitution was structured, not only with separation of powers and federalism, but also the different branches and specifically describing the different branches by comparing them to the Articles of Confederation. So I think it hits a lot of the content standards as well as the common core standards that you would have. The small group activity linked with the whole class discussion, that might take a day and a half. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And that's an important part of the preparation and learning about it too. I'm going to move forward and just let you know we have a couple of other upcoming webinars. One is next week. The Common Core does not have to be a great wall. Fun ways to learn about China. That's going to be one week from today. Uh, same time, 3.30 Pacific time. And the following week, we have civic engagement plus writing equals uncommonly good idea. And this uh, is an important one, especially related to collaborative writing in civics. So again, these are free webinars. Please, if you haven't already, register for these. Also, review our resources. This was made possible today. In fact, all these webinars and the resources on this page that you see linked here were made possible by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, a grant that we got a year ago to help develop these. And so please go to this web page. This will also be linked in the email you get and review our resources because not only will you be helping us keep these materials coming to you for free, finally, if you have any questions or comments about this webinar or anything you've uh, heard today, please shoot me an email. And I want to again thank Laura Wesley for being instrumental in getting this organized for you today. So thank you very much, and I want to thank you, Pam, also for being here and sharing your expertise for us today. It's really essential. Thank you so much.